when the Lord returns, everything's going to be destroyed as well. So if one believes it was just a local flood, then you have to believe maybe a local judgment. Uh, just a certain group or a certain country is going to be uh, judged. And, but that we know that's not the case. So here, Peter is building off of that. In Genesis 6 and verse 5, we see why God destroyed the earth with a flood because of the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Things were bad. I don't think there are, things are as bad today as they were back then. But look at the direction things are going in. Go back 20 years, who would have thought that we would be where we are today, or go back 50 years, and where are we going to be 50 years in the future? I don't know if somebody maybe around here can hang around that long and talk about it, but still, who would have thought things would be where they're at today? From a morality standpoint and wickedness, everything that's taking place, who would have thought that? But it's a pretty bad time, and God saw it. Every intent of the heart, he thought, was evil, evil. And from the flood, we can learn certain lessons. And one lesson being that God's patience has a limit. During this time, God's patience had a limit, enough. 120 years there at least to build the ark. And when 120 years was up, that's when the flood's water, waters came and destroyed mankind. God punished man then, and he still has that power to do so today, should he choose to do so. He can punish individuals. He can punish nations. He has that power if he wants to do it. God can, uh, he can uh, sort of say, if that's the way you want to go, then go. I've had enough of you. He can do that. Here's three verses we find in Romans. Romans 124. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. He gave them up. I had enough. Verse 26. And for this reason God gave them up to vile passions. I've had enough, he said. In Romans 128. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. To do those things which are not fitting. God said, I have enough. I tried to warn you, tried to, tried to get you to go in a direction. Well, go ahead and go. Go ahead and go. So the patience of God, it has a limit. And one day it'll be limited. It, it'll run out. And he'll call judgment on the world. And, and that'll be the end of it. But we don't know when that'll be, but God has a limit. He told Abraham, if he can find ten righteous souls, and Sodom and Gomorrah, he wouldn't destroy it. And Abraham couldn't find ten. Couldn't find ten. Uh, what if God is, what if we're the ones that stand between God destroying again or coming back again and not? What if we're the ones? That's keeping that from happening. Could be. We don't know. Don't know the mind of God. And we, we know we are the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And, and we got to let that light shine. And so we pray about it. We pray about our nation. We pray about the, the direction. We pray, we pray about the world. If we stop, God must say, okay, I can't find ten people down there to do this. And it may be the end of it. Uh, <clears throat> you think back, a, go back a generation, and you find a worldly people, worldly people, not Christians, worldly people, who would not stand for what's going on today. And you come into this generation, and you have church going people who have no problem with what's going on today. See how things, things have changed quite a bit. One generation, what will, what will bring about on the next generation? 
But in Genesis 6 and verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the midst of all the evil, uh, God looked down and he found Noah and his family. Uh, Noah didn't get caught up in what was going on around him. He, he stood strong. Even though his warnings to try to tell the people but yet uh, they would not listen. He didn't fall for the wickedness that was going on around him. He was still a, a righteous man. And you think about Sodom and Gomorrah, we think about Lot and his wife and how they were called, the Bible speaks of righteous Lot. He was a good man. He had his moments, but he was righteous Lot. And I'm sure his wife was a, a righteous lady as well. But he had two daughters that were righteous as well. The two daughters that came out with him. Because you remember what the Bible says about them. That in a, that in a city that was so full of corruption, and morality, and all that. The Bible says that he had two virgin daughters. But they get caught up in that. So there's four pretty, I say righteous people that lived. And that was it. That lived there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, they, when they got out, when they, when they escaped, there was immorality that took place between them and their dad, Lot. But yet they were, they were righteous. They were ladies that didn't get caught up in what was going on. And then in Genesis 8 and verse 1, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark, God made a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. So God was with Noah from start to finish, all the way, looking after him, taking care of him. So God did it his way. He did it his way. And then we find Peter speaking about this. He uses the flood in a, in a direct correlation to salvation in 1 Peter 3 20 21 talks about who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved through water there's also an antitype now which saves us baptism not the removing of the filth of the flesh but the answer of good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ God is, of course, long-suffering. He doesn't want anyone to, to perish, as he was in the days of, of Noah, and the same is true today. And he uses the flood here as, as an example. You know, the flood waters cleanse the earth of the wickedness, and, and, and the baptism, that's when we are cleansed as well of our sin. That's when the blood of Christ cleanses us. So here they're used in, in similar ways as a type and anti-type. Uh, there are many of them in the scriptures that we could turn to. You could look and there were a shadow of things to come. The people at the time didn't realize it, but because we can look back, we can realize it. Like when the last plague came upon Egypt and Israel, they put the blood of the, of the, of the lamb over the doors and, and that plague passed over and saved the life of the firstborn. Without that blood, uh, they have been lost. At least the firstborn would have been lost. The first, that animal had to be, you know, a male, had to be spotless. And other things they had to do in order to make things right that night. And, well, again, Christ is considered a lamb. He's the, the spotless lamb as well. So there are many things that, uh, types and any types that find in the Old Testament we can look at them in the new and realize what well, God was teaching a lesson back then. They didn't un understand it, but we can look back and we can compare the two and see how it works. So the, the flood, a major event happened there in Genesis. Any, any comment or thought on the flood about Noah? Now the next one is the Tower, Tower of Babel. 
when we think of the Tower of Babel, uh, the scattering of the people and the different languages is what comes to mind when we think about that. At least that's what I think about. And I asked you last week, when did the people become different language? When did it happen? When did God scatter? Well, we're all thinking it, it happened while they were building the tower. God came down, saw everything that was going on, and that's when he began to change their language and scatter. Well, some individuals who are trying to find error in the Bible will say, no, it happened way before that. And they go to a chapter before, Genesis chapter 10, and, and look, what he, look how he describes this genealogy here. For these, from these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, every one according to his language, according to their families, and to the nations, their nations. Verse 5 has them already divided up, speaking different languages. Verse 20, and there were the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, in, the, in their lands and in their nations. Another. According to their language, they're already divided up. It's chapter 10, verse 31. Now these were the sons of Shem, according to, to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. So here, Shem, he's already in another place and already speaking another language. But yet we go, we say, well, chapter 11 is where it happened. But somebody who's trying to... Uh, say the Bible contradicts itself and don't want to believe the Bible, they'll say, well, you've got a problem right here. Well, there's no problem right here because chapter 10 is a, a, a chronology of the people before the Tower of Babel, during the Tower of Babel, and after the Tower of Babel. It covers the whole range here from the first one to the last one. And then they go back and they pick up at the Tower of Babel how it all happened. So one might be reading chapter 10 and wonder, well, how did this uh, different languages come about? How were they scattered? Well, chapter 11 is where you're told that. So it's not a contradiction. Chapter 11 at the Tower is when it happened. Now, sometimes in a... You, you can't go about and read the Bible like you would any other book. And that's where people get in trouble. They think it's in chronological order. This happened first, this happened second, this happened third, and that's how they want it to happen. Read, but that's not how the Bible is written. It may be written apart here, and then it picks up something in the middle, and then you got to you know, put it together. That's how, that's how God wanted it to be written uh, that way. It's sort of like somebody that you watch a football game, and and it's over, and you're, you're trying to tell somebody everything that happened, some of the went on. Do you tell them play by play what happened? Or do you pick out the big plays? You know, there was that pick six. Or there was that pass during overtime. Or there was the, uh, the Hail Mary, which they, they scored and won the game. We pick out the big, big things in there. And then maybe we go back and, and talk about the entire game. Well, that's what God is, has done many times in the scriptures. He'll talk about the big things. And then he'll go back and, and then sum it up and talk about it. And that's what has happened in chapter 10. He's talking about what happened before the Tower of Babel, even after the Tower of Babel. And then you go to chapter 11 to see what was taking place. And that brings us to chapter 11 and verse 4. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves as we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So God saw what was going on. And he stopped the work by confusing their language. And he didn't do so because he was worried about them building a tower up into the heavens. He wasn't worried about that. And we know they couldn't have got very far up there until they'd been 
depleted of oxygen and they couldn't have lived, you know, so far up. And we know that. But God didn't destroy them for not making, uh, for making this tower, trying to get to maybe see him. Why did God destroy them? Well, I say destroy them. Why did he change their language and, and scatter them? Why did he do that? There's a reason for it. What? Yeah, but there's a, that's why he messed them up. But there's something they weren't doing. That, they weren't multiplying, filling the earth. Genesis 9 1. <clears throat> so God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And in verse, chapter 11, verse 4, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God said, Be fruitful, multiply, and scatter. No, we're going to stay right here. We're going to stay right here in case we do get scattered. We have this tower to remember something by they had no plans of leaving that place. So God is punishing them for not doing what he said. He told them to get out and go. But they didn't go. They didn't scatter. So he disrupts their language. And that confuses them. And then in chapter 11 and verse 7 and 8, Here the Lord says, Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language. They may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. So here's where he confused their language. And in verse 8, I've heard some speak of this, that when he scattered them, it was a big wind. And whew, here they go. Everybody, you got to... This group lands, you know, 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away or something like that. That's not what happened here. You had a group that could speak, the, their, they knew each other's language, so they went, and there they populated this area. Yeah, God scattered them because they couldn't understand each other. And they, and they formed their own little group colony or nation or whatever, and they go here and they go there, and that's how... You know, they eventually populated the earth by doing it that way. Just think, if they had done what God said, we would all be speaking the same language. The whole world. I don't know what it would be. But we, we would all be speaking the same language. But they didn't. And God confused them. And from this, from, from being negative... And we can always learn something that's positive from even things that are negative. If we go back to Genesis 11, 5, and 6, if you notice they were, the people were working as one, and they were united, and whatever they, they proposed to do, they did. That's a good thing. They, if they had scattered, as God said in the beginning, that have been a great thing. But from a, something that's negative, we can find something that's good. And because of their being united, they were doing a big work here, a big work building this tower. And we can do, we can do the same thing if, if, as a church if we are united as well. If we don't get caught up in devouring one another and hurting one another, as sometimes happens in congregations, we just need to get it together and put our mind to work as they did building the wall around Jerusalem, as Nehemiah told us. A mind to work. Doesn't mean we've got to all come together at one time and do something. We're all working together for the same cause. Individually, we're out here doing what we can do. And that's working together as well for the same cause. So we can learn from them 
something positive in a negative situation. Anything on the tower? All right, next week we begin looking at the individuals. I think Abraham's first one we'll look at, then we go to Isaac, we'll get them covered next week and, and look at some highlights in their life, some things we can learn from them. All right, thank you for being here.